welcome. I'm Dr. Michael Schick. This is a rapid overview of the history of ultrasound and part of a introductory lecture series. The next couple lectures uh, to listen to would be the physics lecture and then the introductory to ultrasound for medical school. So the, for the history of ultrasound, we have come a long way. Just taking a look at these pictures, you can see how large these machines, how complex they used to be, and how difficult they used to be to use. And it all started in 1794. Um, I'm going to mispronounce many of these names, but Lazzaro Spallanzi. He was an Italian physiologist who made some great discoveries. One was in regards to digestion. He was the first one to really understand that digestion wasn't just a mastication process. Um, there was actually a chemical process going on in the stomach and the intestines. Also made some important discoveries important discoveries for uh, fertilization. But the major thing he discovered in regards to ultrasound is that he realized that bats were able to navigate in pitch black conditions. He called this echolocation. He hypothesized that they were using the sound from their uh, voice boxes to find things and not smash into things in the pitch black. That must have been really hard experiments for him to observe um, as they had to be in pitch black conditions. The next great work was done by Jean Daniel Culloden. This is a uh, French physicist who did some really interesting work with light and is one of the people we should thank for optic cables, the ability to use our computers and internet and things like that, but also did experiments with sound in, in water and discovered that sound actually traveled faster through water and you could say that he had the first transducer which were large bells within um, the English Channel and he hypothesized that he could create a, a new communication system um, from England to France through the English Channel which never actually happened but an interesting thought. The next major discovery was in 1880, Pierre and Jacques Curie, also uh, two French uh, physicists, brothers actually, and they discovered the piezoelectric effect. So they hypothesized that you could turn a mechanical stress into an electrical charge. And they experimented all sorts of types of crystals and salts and found that certain salts and quartz were actually the best piezoelectric substances that they could find. And they put these things under stress and they were able to measure an electrical charge being generated from them with very rudimentary tools. They had some wires and some glue and um, just some basic uh, mechanical sets. And importantly, they discovered that the piezoelectric effect can occur in reverse as well. So they're able to put electrical charges through quartz and create a mechanical effect. And that is what we do with ultrasound machines. We run electrical current through crystals, which creates uh, vibrating crystals and then creates a ultrasonic longitudinal compressive wave. In 1915, Paul Langevin, another French physicist, took this idea after the Titanic sank in 1912 and thought that he could create an ultrasound device that could help detect icebergs in the way of these ships and also submarines. And he was, in fact, able to do this, and it was used in uh, several submarines in World War I. 1942, Carl Dusik uh, was a neurologist and physiatrist at the University of Vienna. He was the first one uh, to use this as a physician for humans. He was diagnosing brain tumors using... Uh, A-mode ultrasound, and it's interesting that we're just starting to sort of go back to this uh, cranial ultrasound now after so many years. In 1948, George Ludwig, uh, he was an internist who first uh, described the use of ultrasound to diagnose gallstones, so we moved past the, the cranium and moved into other body areas. In 1958, uh, Ian Donald, he was a Scottish physician um, who worked at the shipyard, also uh, worked as a um, flight surgeon, and really is the pioneer of OBGYN ultrasound, and you could say abdominal ultrasound too, because he was looking for abdominal masses, and this is how he started getting into uh, ultrasound and the use of abdominal pathology. 1950s through 60s, uh, Douglas Howery and Joseph Holmes really pioneered the two-dimensional 
B mode ultrasound, and this is really what we're using still to this day. They're at the University of Colorado, and this is a real first boom in diagnostic imaging. And during this time, the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine was also founded. In the 1970s, uh, ophthalmologists started using ultrasound for ocular reasons. Also, vascular surgeons started using Doppler. And then the first uses of point-of-care ultrasound began in Germany and Japan, where physicians started evaluating patients for pericardial effusions. The 1980s is really the second large boom of ultrasound. And this is where it moves into the United States and we start using it for many, many things. So power Doppler is developed, 3D ultrasound is developed, and point-of-care ultrasound really takes hold and takes off in the United States. In 1997, the first point-of-care ultrasound fellowship is established in Chicago. And then in 2001, our American Academy of Emergency Physicians comes out with guidelines about the use of point-of-care ultrasound in our practice and really helps define it for many other practices and specialties as well. And with this boom of ultrasound and uh, increased use comes technology advancement. And now there's amazing devices that are small, handheld, have great uh, clarity, um, and really has changed the way we diagnose patients and what we can do in many environments. Ultrasound is important for so many reasons, but just to highlight what the WHO estimates uh, that 75% of the world's population has no access to diagnostic imaging. And so we can really change that with ultrasound because it's so versatile and portable, now inexpensive and continues to be safe because there's no radiation. It's really practice changing and it's gonna change the whole sort of diagnostic landscape throughout the world and um, can be provided everywhere, not just in developed countries. And it really puts the power in the hand of the practitioners because they can diagnose things now at the bedside. Um, so it really, this is like versatility defined. You can take ultrasound anywhere. You can have portable uh, devices to help uh, power uh, your ultrasound machines. They can be used in any rural, tactical, or developing environment. Here's uh, up in Everest, and then even the space station, we're using ultrasound. And myself uh, in kind of rural Africa teaching ultrasound. And it's been used in almost every specialty now for multiple reasons and continues to expand in its use. The other thing I wanted to mention is that ultrasound is also an amazing tool for education and it's now moving into many medical schools to augment teaching anatomy, physical exam, physiology, pathology, and many other subjects. It's also a tool that really all residents need to learn because all interns and residents are doing procedures on patients in the hospital and if we and I argue if we teach interns and residents to do ACLS, advanced cardiac life support, then we should teach them how to diagnose those things that can put patients into PEA code. And many of those things need to be identified with point-of-care ultrasound.